Okay, so let's start going towards our, our goal, but cautiously. Because, the, well, let me first state the goal. So we will have a sum of, I'll put in the details in a moment, but we'll have cosine nx and sine nx, okay? And each one of them will get its own coefficient, a sub n and b sub n. And so the question is, how do you determine these coefficients? We'll sum them all together from n from 1 to infinity. 1 is important, not 0. I'll have to make up for that. Plus, and then we'll have another sum, sines and cosines, two sums. Okay, this is the kind of series we're looking for. And you have to realize that all the sines and cosines, they're centered right on the axis. So if the function is an average above the axis, this won't be able to help us. Sines and cosines won't be able to help us. So we want another free term, and it's usually called A0. A0. Okay, so this is what a Fourier series looks like. A constant term plus a bunch of cosines and a bunch of sines. And you could have said, well, you could just consider cosine of 0x, and that's like a constant, right? But there is a nice reason why you want to take it out separately, because the formula will be slightly different for a0 compared to all the other a's. That's one thing I'll mention. And the other thing I'll mention is that you're seeing some bulk here. There is a0, there's a sub n's, there is b sub n's, there's sines, there's cosines, there's constant terms. It looks like a hodgepodge of a few things. Do you agree with me? Well, this issue is perfectly valid, and that can be alleviated by complex numbers. So right now, I will do the discussion without the complex numbers, and then you will show, and then you will see just how much more elegant all of this becomes when instead of doing sines and cosines, with real coefficients, you use complex exponentials with complex coefficients. All of this cumbersomeness goes away completely. Okay. First thing you'll say, let's argue together that no, of course it's not possible to represent every function by our Fourier series. Of course it's not possible. Let's argue that. And you will say, well, this function is whatever it is. We don't know how it continues beyond the segment. This, no matter how you slice it, is periodic. 2 pi periodic. Each one of these functions that we're adding together is 2 pi periodic. Okay, that's a very valid point. So what we'll actually be getting is not this function, however it may continue beyond this segment, but it's repeated periodic version. So we're, whatever the function is, the Fourier series necessarily zooms in on a particular window and then essentially implies that the function is repeated periodically with a period of 2 pi. So that's limitation number one. Okay, so that's one. But another statement that you could make is, well, if we're talking about a periodic repetition of a function, then a perfectly nice function like f of x equals x will become, in this periodic repetition sense, discontinuous. Look, where can I make a small, well, how about right here? Here is my segment from minus pi to pi. And here is f of x equals x. Perfectly nice continuous function. But if you represent it in terms of these periodic sines and cosines, you're really representing this. And so it will be this drop. And you will say, well, that's the reason why this is impossible. Because how can these perfectly smooth functions represent another function that's not continuous, let alone differentiable? It's just not continuous. How is that possible? Well, it turns out that it is possible 
in a certain sense. It won't be everywhere point for point because it couldn't possibly give you this point and this point because they're two different values and this is a single valued function. However, what saves you here is this infinity. When you have a finite number of functions, this is obviously impossible because you would get a smooth function. But in the limit, the function that you're getting will, will approach this function. And actually in a very interesting way. I'll attempt to draw it a little bit. So it'll definitely go like this. And then there will be some oscillations here that will go down and then go again and then go like this. Okay? And these oscillations will always be getting a little bit bigger when you get to this difficult point of discontinuity. But what, what you will notice will happen when you take, as you take more and more term. The region where these big, big wiggles occur will be getting narrower and narrower. Unfortunately, the height of those wiggles will not be going down. But the region where those wiggles occur will be going down. An interesting phenomenon called the Gibbs phenomenon. Gibbs phenomenon. A very interesting story, very much a credit to Gibbs, that he first published a paper where he said this won't happen. So Gibbs is early 20th century, Yale. The one thing Yale should be proud of, Gibbs. And then, so then he had to write a paper where he corrected and said, oh no, these wiggles will do as what I just described. I forget, that may have happened in a footnote. But this person, this individual was working so hard uh, that he was just producing and producing and producing and may not have had time to, to double check. And, uh, he was just very eager to share what he found. So on some occasions he had to go back and correct himself a little bit, which is just a tribute to his style of work. Okay, so that's called the Gibbs phenomenon. So yes, a discontinuous function is a little bit problematic, especially in the practical sense, because it will, you will get these oscillations that as far as amplitude will not go down. So on a practical level, you absolutely have to deal with it. And so we'll discover a little bit about how these sorts of functions behave. And another interesting fact, this is more from analysis, so we don't really care about the proof of it, is that whenever there is a discontinuity like here, the function will actually converge to exactly their average in the middle. So on the right, it will converge to the function. On the left, it will converge to the function in the limit. But right at this point, it will give you neither this point nor this point with the point right in the middle, which you can use for a solution to the Basel problem, the sum of inverse squares. We'll see if, we'll see if we have an opportunity to take a look at that. Okay, so that's how it would work. So yes, we'll discover that even functions that where periodic, repeti peri periodic repetition causes discontinuities, you can still represent perfectly, so to speak, from the analysis point of view, as a linear combination, an infinite linear combination of perfectly smooth functions. So kind of a beautiful thing, what's going on here. The generality, I would argue, is much more than you would expect. So general is this method that it took new ideas from Cantor to show that, no, you can't get all the functions. In fact, in a certain sense, you miss most of the functions. But this was uh, a matter of debate for decades, obviously continued into the 20th century, and just produced a lot of beautiful and very useful mathematics.